If I could go back, right back, in fact, to uh, before you started making films, um, at the age of 15, you played the lead in Death of a Salesman. Mm. Were you good? For 15, I was very good. <laughs> well, I saw uh, Lee J. Cobb do Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman when I was 15. And it was the greatest performance I'd ever seen anywhere, in any medium in my life, in my short life. And that was when I decided that I wanted to be a real actor and not uh, a comedian. I'm separating comic actor from comedian because they're two different things. Mm. But I wanted to be an actor. And I went home to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I made a, an hour's adaptation of Death of a Salesman. And it was during one of the performances, while I was planting the seeds of carrots and radishes and beets and I forget what all, in my make-believe garden, I did, during that time, believe uh, that I was in the garden and felt the earth, and I did start to cry, and I wasn't exactly sure what was happening to me, but somewhere I must have been very relaxed, because it's very difficult to have such a moment if you're tense, but something happened. It was not a psychotic phase. I was in full control, but it, was, it called upon emotions that were repeated in me. I know m more now what happened, but it would be technical. I don't want to go into a lot of phony baloney explanations, but it was just a real moment. What I later went to school to learn how to repeat. Mm. But it was during Death of a Salesman that it happened. Because uh, you played it very much against the uh, lines when you played The Undertaker in Bonnie and Clyde. Certainly, it wasn't the way Arthur Penn saw the part, was it? I, I didn't know that he didn't see it the way I played it because he's a good director. I only found that out um, months later. And I said, but why didn't you stop me if it wasn't what you wanted? He said, if I didn't see something better than what I wanted, mm -hmm. I would have stopped you. But what you were doing was better than what the author and I had uh, pictured. I would have thought that uh, a watershed in your career came when you met Mel Brooks. Uh, you were playing in Mother Courage with uh, Anne Bancroft, in fact. Did you see it as an important meeting right away? <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> <laughs> when God spoke to Moses the first time, if you ask him, was that significant in your life? <laughs> it was like that, wasn't it? Yes, when the bush actually went on fire. <laughs> I would say it had some minor importance, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be overlooked in this uh, no, interview, I, I think. No, I wouldn't relegate it to the back room, <laughs> no. It was right up there, <laughs> along with birth and marriage and <laughs> things like that. <laughs> um, Actually, quite seriously, did, did I'm did, being serious. <laughs> no, no, I know you are. But did you... Well, was he at that time your peer, or was... I mean, did you play Trilby to his Sven Gali? Oh, do you mean where we were at in our careers at that time? Mm. Oh, well, he had, he had been head writer for the most popular, most, uh, the best comedy ever on television, which was your show of shows, Sid Caesar's, your show of shows. That is, he was the head writer, and people working under him were uh, Neil Simon and Woody Allen, Dick Cavett, uh, people I'm forgetting now who are equally well known. Um, sure, so I mean, so he, I mean, was, he, the, was, he the was the top the of the heap. Yeah. He was, mm -hmm. at this time, he wasn't writing anymore, and he was in a big period of transition. He was writing uh, something called Springtime for Hitler, although I didn't know it. But um, he was making a changeover from television to movies. I was in my second Broadway play, and people didn't know me from Adam, really. So what was your reaction when he asked you to appear in The Producers? Happiness. I was very happy. When you were nominated for an Academy Award, for that part, in fact, did you feel that, um, that you'd arrived? Arrived where? I'm not being facetious. Uh, s success as an actor, uh, fame and popularity, yes, well known. Yes, really. Mm. I thought that it was... Um, When 
when I think back to those days now, how fragile that kind of success is, my tendency is to say no. But to be honest, I think I probably thought, yes, I had arrived. I'll tell you why I ask. It's that almost every article I've read about you um, suggests that uh, Gene Wilder feels insecure. In fact, you spent something like seven years, I think, in analysis. Uh, how well... You don't have to be insecure to be in analysis. No, 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 no. But I said the suggestion was that you are. Yeah. Are you insecure? Like every human being, I'm insecure in some things and very confident in others. Um, this uh, desire for self-knowledge, is, is that part of the key to your acting? Well, only I uh, repeat what my teacher, uh, my eventual teacher, Lee Strasberg, had said, that uh, analysis, to the extent that it helps you to, to be freer, it can't help but benefit your acting. When you made uh, Start the Revolution Without Me with uh, Donald Sutherland, uh, had you decided by this time that your forte was comedy? Or comic acting? Uh, I, had, I had come much closer to the opinion that I was here for more specific purposes in my work than I had ever thought about before. And that they seemed to have to do with doing bizarre actions realistically. And that was best served for me in a comedy. I got a great thrill out of that, a joy. And it seemed to be what I could do better than other actors when I could so easily think of so many other things that other actors could do better than me. Mm. But I felt, I was beginning to feel that that was my, more my mission in my work than doing uh, Hamlet. I'll leave that to Albert Finney. <laughs> oh, then in uh, 1972, you did Woody Allen's Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex, which of course was a series of sketches, and you played the man in love with the sheep. Now, there are many ways of playing that scene. You chose to play it absolutely dead straight, seriously. Yeah, I thought there was only one way to play it. <laughs> so, uh, of course, I suppose there would be many ways, but that was a little bit like the Bonnie and Clyde situation. Also, I was a little smarter actor then than I was at the beginning. Woody Allen said uh, there was a movie called uh, Sister Carrie with Laurence Olivier and uh, Jennifer Jones. And he said, I want you to play this part. I'd like you to play uh, Laurence Olivier's part. It will be exactly as the original, but instead of Jennifer Jones, it will be a sheep. <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I said, that sounds logical. Uh, but knowing that he wrote it with that in mind, it was not difficult to understand why he wanted me to play it. I imagine that could I believe, is it possible for me to believe that a man, a human being, could be attracted to a sheep? That's what I had to imagine. If I said, uh, what can I do to have fun with this sheep, period, then it's just a um, variety hour, it's a comedy sketch. But if I say, okay, we know it's a sheep and the audience is going to laugh at the beginning. Now, if you really want them to laugh in the second scene, in the third scene, in the fifth scene, you've got to do more than just have fun with the, f with the fact that it's a sheep, but believe that maybe it's possible that a human being could start to go a little crazy for this sheep. Could literally, and I had to find things about that sheep. Now, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but that particular sheep, not its double, by the way, but that particular sheep had very dark hairs around its eyes. Very beautiful eyes, I thought. Which I found <laughs> very extraordinarily attractive. attractive. <laughs> We're in love with the same girl. Now, <laughs> I would look at the, the sheep that was always there as a standby, and it didn't have those dark hairs around. And I thought, that's really an ugly sheep compared to my sheep. So there was, a, <laughs> there was a beginning, a starting point right there. It seems to me that in all the parts you've played, there's a quality of, of innocence deep down there somewhere. There's a quality that's my father, I think. My father was born in Russia and came to America when he was 11 years old. 
And I thought all the time that my artistic tendencies came from my mother, who was studying to be a concert pianist. And I found out many years later that the real bulk of whatever I was doing, the roots of it, the well, had more to do with my father and that naive, that innocence that he brought over with him from the old country. Uh, I, I know this quality that you're talking about. Um, it's like a, a vulnerability, and um, I have to be aware of it, and I have to also know how to forget about it. It's not an effect you strive for. I hope it? not. I hope not. Mm. Young Frankenstein, which came next, is made with real affection for the James Whale movie of the 30s. Um, it was also genuinely scary in the right places. Now, I'm sure you were right to make that decision, but was there a temptation to spoof it? Well, as I say, as I said before, it was born out of childhood memories, and those memories were mostly ones of being scared. <laughs> then, years later, the, the love and, and even being able to see the humor came. But originally, it was a scary thing, uh, a scary memory. So to do the picture without the scary part would be, it would, it would have been a waste for my money. Mm. I'm just wondering, the fact that you do know that you've got three more pictures to do for 20th Century Fox, does that make you feel a little less insecure? <laughs> Anxious? Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a little secret. You can have a 2,700 picture deal with a studio, but chances are that if your last picture didn't make money, they'll find some way to stop it after one. <laughs> Security of the kind you're talking about would come from uh, deeper sources than having a contract that says three more pictures. <laughs>